are one week away from Mother's Day. Next Sunday is Mother's Day, and uh, we're going to be doing, yeah, we can already go ahead and give a hand to our moms, and uh, uh, next week we're going to be doing some very special things to, to honor mothers, and so I would encourage you, invite your mother to be with us next Sunday, and moms, invite your family to be with us. It's a great day for us to worship together as a church family, and uh, one of the um, most fun times of the year we have here at church, we'll be recognizing some special moms, and I promise we're going to have a really special treat, something brand new for all of the moms that are here that's going to uh, kind of just uh, 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 satisfy that sweet tooth craving mom that you have, and uh, it's going to be a, ah, now you're coming, now that I said something about, uh, said something about craving that sweet tooth, but uh, it's going to be a great week. Take your Bibles with me and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. To me, it's always amazing how much children look like their parents. Even, even from a newborn age, last Sunday I had the privilege after church of going and meeting uh, one of our newest members. And by the way, we have, I don't know how many different mothers that we have that are expecting, but um, our nursery is exploding and we like that. And so last Sunday I was at the hospital and I was, I was able to meet um, a new little member to Hollywood Community Church and uh, I was looking at him and actually this, this baby, I won't say his name, this baby had more hair than any baby I've ever seen in my entire life. As a matter of fact, the one uncle says, hey, Brian, I want you to know from here, we're going straight to the barber shop to give the baby a haircut. But, but as I looked at the baby and then I looked at the dad, it, it amazed me how much this little one, who was just a few hours old, how much this little one looked like his father. And it just reminded me how much children are like their parents. Frequently, people tell me how much I look like my dad. And I always denied it. I'm always like, no, man, my dad's so much older than I am. And I'm a whole lot cooler than my dad. Come on, what do you mean I look like my dad? And not long ago, I was looking through old pictures, and I saw this picture of my dad who had glasses just like I have on. And his hair was combed just like mine. And I'm like oh my word, I do look like my dad. And then I kind of looked at myself in the mirror and I realized I'm taking on the same shape as my dad. I, I look just like my father. Well, what is true biologically is also true spiritually. You, you see, as spiritual children of God, our goal is to take on his appearance. Isn't that a great thought? As spiritual children of God, our goal is to take on His appearance. We should strive to look more and more like God, to act more and more like God each and every day and like His Son, Jesus Christ. One of the cool things for me as a pastor is seeing God work in the lives of our church family. I love watching you. I love watching you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ and to see you become molded more and more into his image, looking more and more like him. That's such an, a cool and exciting thing for me as a pastor. Unfortunately, though, there are times when our words and there are times when our actions remind us not of the spiritual family to which we now belong, but at times our words and our actions remind us of the family from which we came. In other words, at times the things we say remind us more of our ex-father, the devil, than they do Jesus Christ, who we are trying to emulate. I know that might seem like an extremely strong statement today, and I don't want to look at you and say, boy, you remind me of somebody. Who is that? Oh, yeah, it's the devil. That's who you remind me of. That's not what I'm saying this morning. That's a strong statement. But I will say this. We demonstrate our diabolical ancestry every time we lie. Every time we deceive. Every time we break a promise, 
We are not acting like our heavenly Father, but we are acting like our earthly Father. We're not acting like a holy, righteous God, but we're acting like a wicked devil. You say, man, Brian, that's tough. Hey, once again, I'm just repeating the words of Jesus. Notice what Jesus said in John 8, 44, and we'll get to Matthew 5 in just a second. Jesus looked at the religious leaders of his day, and he said this, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, now quite frankly, I want to make sure that my words and my actions don't resemble that. And you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, should make sure that our words and our actions are, are characterized. They are, they are, they are uh, demonstrating truthfulness rather than being untrue in what we say. And yet, sadly, untruthfulness, deception, dishonesty characterizes the culture in which we live. I read some statistics this week that surprised me. They might not surprise you, but they surprised me. I read that by the age of four, by the age of four years old, 90% of children have learned to lie. Now think about that. And it's not like you and I sit down. It's not like I sit down with my kids and say, okay, Mark, sit down right now. Let me tell you how to lie to your mother, all right, with a straight face. Let me tell you how to do that. We don't teach our kids to lie. That what? That sinful nature that each of them has seems to bubble up in them. And even at the age of four, they've already at times become masters of lying, We've all heard the stories and seen with our own kids. You know, they get their hand in the cookie jar and they eat cookies and you come to your little one and say, did you eat a cookie? And chocolate is all over their face. And they're like, no, I didn't eat a cookie. You know, not realizing that they're guilty and they're caught, but they what? They lie. Here's another statistic. 60% of adults cannot have a 10-minute conversation without stating an untruth. It might be an exaggeration. It might be an outright lie. It might be saying something to not offend somebody else. 60% of adults. They say that most people lie an average of four times a day. Now here's the amazing statistics. Our statistic, they say that men lie six times a day and that women lie three times a day. Let's give it up for the honest women in our congregation, right? What would the, what would the statistics be, guys, if, uh, if we didn't have their honesty? You and I are lied to some 200 times a day. In other words, we are, we're bombarded by lies, whether it's through coworkers, whether it's family members. We turn on the television, and they're telling us all of these products that we're going to die unless we have, you know, and they what? They're... They're repeatedly lying to us. We are, we are surrounded by untruths, are we not? Can we believe everything our politicians tell us? Are the news stations just a little bit biased? Can you believe everything that you read on the internet? Hey, believe it or not, Wikipedia is not, or Wikipedia is not the, the, um, the, uh, um, the source of truth. Some 200 times a day we're lied to. And psychologists tell us that we only have the capacity to distinguish about 50% of those lies. So we're not only being bombarded by lies, but we are believing lies. Here's what I'm saying this morning. Lying in our culture has become an acceptable form of communication. It's become an acceptable form of communication. In the verses that we're studying this morning, Jesus exhorts us to always tell the truth. Let me say that again. In the verses that we're studying this morning, Jesus exhorts us to always tell the truth. As a matter of fact, he clearly shows that there is never a reason to hide, bend, 
or distorts the truth. And so look with me in Matthew chapter 5. We're reading verses 33 through 37. Matthew 5, 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Wouldn't it be great if we could make our white hairs black and our no hairs appear again, if we could do that, (laughs) all right? (laughs) But he says you can't do that. Verse 37, let what you say be simply yes or no. And then he makes a bombshell of a statement that we're going to end with today. He says, anything more than that comes from evil. Would you pray with me today? Lord, uh, help us to understand your word as we study these verses. And so we ask the Holy Spirit of God to be our teacher today. Help us not only to understand, but help us to be willing to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. sons and good staff and everything, huh? Why don't you stay right here just in case I need you all service long, right? All right. A couple of things. Let's ignore him. A couple of things. Uh, The first thing we see is this. In this passage, Jesus makes reference to several Old Testament passages. As he's done throughout the Sermon on the Mount. By the way, we're walking through the Sermon on the Mount and and we've uh, we've defined our series as flipped because Jesus takes what what we have believed at times what we have been taught and Jesus kind of flips it upside down and, and, and he makes us realize man, our lives should be completely different and he's done that by so or in so many areas and, man, and by the way, so many of you have expressed to me as, as if I'd several people even today say, man, Brian, these verses are stepping all over my toes. And these verses are speaking to me. That's what God's word is intended to do. And God wants to change us and flip us for his honor and for his glory. And so here specifically in verse 33, Jesus makes reference not just to one Old Testament verse, but many believe that Jesus here um, uh, uses a composite of several different Old Testament scriptures that form the foundation for his teaching on telling the truth. So I want to look at a couple of these passages that Jesus is referring to and kind of draw some conclusions for us today. The first is a passage of scripture that you're familiar with. It's found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16. Exodus 20 contains what we call the Ten Commandments. And the ninth commandment, Jesus makes this statement. He says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. All right, so here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that you and I should not speak an untruth against another person. You say, Brian, how would we do that? I know specifically he might even be talking about standing in a court of law and, and you're there as a witness and, and you're standing before the accused and, and you make an accusation that is not true. Jesus is saying, the Old Testament is saying, don't do that. But I believe it speaks to more than that. You see, um, we may either seek to damage our neighbor by giving false evidence against him, as I mentioned in the court of justice, or simply talking bad about him or her to others. None of us would ever do that, would we? This command would entail gossip. This command would entail untrue public criticisms. This command would entail the repeating of statements without checking the facts. Have any of us ever done that? Oh my word, you are not gonna believe what I heard about this person. Now listen, don't say anything to anybody else because I'm not sure whether it's true, but this is unbelievable. And we, and we begin to what? Convey some knowledge, some facts about a person that we're not even sure whether it's true or not. What are we doing? We are bearing false witness. By the way, you and I shouldn't be talking about other people anyways. 
But when we do talk about other people, we must make sure that our facts are correct. We must make sure that we are speaking the truth. That's what the Old Testament says. You should not speak in untruth against another person. Let me show you a second one. The second one is this. You should not speak in untruth to another person. Just kind of changing the preposition there. But you and I should not speak an untruth to another person. Notice Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 11. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. I find it interesting that the Old Testament there lumps together stealing cheating and lying and classifies them all together in the same family of sins. So here's what Jesus is saying. You and I should not speak in untruth to one another. Whether it's innocent in our minds, whether it's not that big a deal, the Bible says that we should not lie to one another. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak, let, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So what's the idea? I have an obligation to always tell you the truth. And you have an obligation to always tell me the truth. It's interesting, I, I read a lot this week and I was reading through what are some of the most believable professions. And, and it was interesting, you know, I thought, oh my word, pastors are gonna be right there at the top of the list. Guess what? We're not at the top of the list, all right? The most believable profession, according to recent statistics, is that of nurses. Do we have any nurses in our congregation today? Nurses are the most believable. The second most believable are pharmacists. I'm not exactly sure why. I know we have some pharmacists in our congregation. And then there's doctors, and uh, you come down the list to number six, and number six are pastors. I'm not sure why we're pastors. I need to work on making sure that what I tell you is truthful, all right? Here's what Jesus is saying. We should always tell the truth to one another. So as Jesus is kind of introducing this, as he's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees and the people there, and he's talking about the, the importance of honesty, he's saying you should speak or you should not speak an untruth to another person. Here's a, here, here's a third one as we kind of walk through this. The third thing Jesus is saying is this. You should not make promises that you cannot keep. You should not make promises that you cannot keep. Let me show you two verses. Numbers 30 and verse 2. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you and you will be guilty of sin. Man, as I was thinking through this, man, God was stepping all over my toes. How often do we make promises that we do not fulfill? Hey, Hey, Mike, I'm on the phone with somebody else. I'll call you back in five minutes. And three days pass, and we still haven't called that person back. Hey, you know what? I promise. I know you need that help. Uh, I'll come over tomorrow. I'll be by your house tomorrow, and I'll help you. Tomorrow comes, and we don't what? We don't do anything. Hey, you know what? I know I'm late on that payment. I'm putting a check in the mail today. And we're not putting a check in the mail today. We make what? We make promises that we don't fulfill. Justin and Mark would remind me that as a dad, I have made promises to them that I have not fulfilled. When we were missionaries in Mexico, I told them, we're going to go to a soccer game. We're going to go to a professional soccer game in the Estadio Azteca there in Mexico City, and we're going to go see America. We're going to go see UNAM. I'm going to take you to see a professional soccer game. Well, to this date, 
I've never taken them to a professional soccer game. I had great excuses. I was preaching the gospel. I was building churches. I was a missionary. But, but Justin, every time he comes home, hey, Dad, when are we going to that soccer game you promised me about 20 years ago? And I look at him and say, I haven't lied yet. I'm still alive. There's still time for me to take you, all right? How often do we make promises that we do not fulfill, whether it's to our kids or whether it's to other people? But even more serious, what these verses are talking about, how often do we make promises to God that we do not fulfill? Oh, man, Lord, I'm in a tough situation. If you get me out of this situation, I promise that I will do this for the rest of my life. I promise that I won't miss another Sunday until I die. I promise, God, if you get me out of this financial situation, that I will give a tenth of my income to you. God, I promise. And guess what God does? God in his faithfulness gets us out of that situation. And we in our unfaithfulness, often what do we do? We forget the promise that we made to God. And in these verses, the Old Testament says, listen, do not make a vow specifically to God. Do not make a promise specifically to God if you are not able to fulfill it. Because he says in no uncertain terms, you will be guilty of sin. He talks about an oath here talks about making an oath and an oath let me describe an oath is in your notes an oath is a promise made in the name of someone superior than yourself to invoke greater credibility we see an oath defined in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 16 where the writer of Hebrews says for people swear by something greater than themselves and in all their disputes is oh an oath is final for confirmation. So here's what it's talking about. A dispute is taking place. They're trying to find the truth and all of a sudden somebody comes in and says no, 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 wait a second. I swear to God that's true. And the person swears on not their own credibility at that moment but the person swears on the credibility of God. How often do we do that? At times we make a statement, and because we want the statement to be believable, we'll make the statement and we'll say, no, swear to God, it's true. The idea being that because God's name is greater than ours, his name validates the veracity of the statement. By the way, God allowed his people to do that in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 12 says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Many of the Old Testament patriarchs made oaths and promises in God's name. If you swear in God's name, here's what I would encourage you. You had best fulfill your promise. Because if not, you profane the name of the Lord And as we already mentioned in the passage, you will be guilty of sin. So here's three admonitions. When Jesus takes that first verse and says, listen, you have heard that the Old Testament says this. Jesus makes three admonitions. The first is this. You should not speak an untruth about another person. The second one is, you should not speak an untruth to another person. And the third one is this. You should not make promises that you should not keep. All right? So as Jesus encapsulated that teaching, that's what he was saying to the Pharisees. But the second thing that we need to understand is this. The Jewish religious leaders had taken those Old Testament commands and they had perverted the Old Testament teaching as they've done with many of the things that Jesus is dealing with. They took those commands about about keeping your vows and they perverted it and made it into something that was convenient for them. You say, Brian, what do you mean? Well, the Jewish religious leaders believed that they could renege on any promise that was not made in God's name. In other words, if they didn't make the promise in God's name, they didn't have to fulfill the promise. In other words, as our text says, they often swore by heaven. They would say something and they'll say, no, 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 listen, I swear by heaven, that's true. They swore by earth. They swore by the city of Jerusalem. 
or they even swore by the hairs of their head. Now, I hate to say this. Some of us couldn't do that here this morning, all right? But, but some of us can do it. They swore they had just a, a, a multiplicity of things by which they swore. So here's what they would do. They would use anything of substance or value to try to validate what they were saying. Here's the kicker, though. The kicker, though, is that they believed that such validations did not require them to tell the truth. If they swore by heaven, they didn't have to tell the truth. If they swore by Jerusalem, they didn't have to tell the truth. And so they would make up all these believable things that they would swear by, but in their minds, they knew they were stating an untruth, but they made the untruth seem believable by swearing by something that was greater than them. They believed that they were only required to tell the truth if they swore by God's name. If they swore by anything else, they didn't have to tell the truth. As I read that and understood that, here's what I, I, it kind of infuriated me a little bit, and I wrote, this might not be the most spiritual statement that I wrote in my notes, but I wrote, oh my word, what a crock, man. What a, what a, what a terrible excuse. They intentionally deceived and then multiplied their deception by swearing on something else of value. And we can sit back and say, oh my word, how dare they do that? And yet in our culture, we tend to do the exact same thing. No, listen, I swear, I swear on my mother's grave. No, I swear on a stack of Bibles. I swear on a stack of Bibles, that's true. Or I swear on all of the money in my wallet, or whatever you want to say. We, we fudge on the truth, and yet we try to validate those inaccurate statements that we make by swearing on something greater than ourselves. That what was, that's what was taking place in the New Testament. So, so so here's what was taking place to summarize it. They believed that certain forms of deception, untruths, and unfulfilled promises were completely acceptable. Remember, Jesus is attacking the self-righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees because they're saying, no, listen, we're righteous. And Jesus says, remember what Brad preached on a few weeks ago? No, really, you're righteous? Yeah, we haven't committed adultery. Oh, really, have you looked at a woman and lust after, lusted after her? Then you have committed adultery. No, 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 we haven't committed adultery. And then he makes that strong statement about marriage that we studied last week. And he continually demonstrates their sinfulness and their wickedness before God. No, we always tell the truth. Really? Well, yeah, every time we swear in God's name, we tell the truth. How about the other times? Well, we're allowed to lie as long as we don't swear falsely by God's name. As I read that, I thought, man, that sounds an awful lot like the culture in which we live. As I mentioned in the introduction, more than one-third of all adults believe that lying is just plain necessary. And if we polled the congregation today, which we're not going to do, if we pulled the congregation, many of us, I am sure, in our minds would say, no, 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 Brian, man, there are times in which it's more convenient to lie than it is to tell the truth. Many people in this day and age feel that there are bad lies and good lies. Why, there are white lies and there are dirty lies. Lies of convenience and lies that are just plain necessary. Lies of expedience. And some might say, well, Brian, there are times when lying is just plain necessary. Right? Wrong. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus, using the culture of his day and what was taking place in his day, refutes their excuses, their lack of honesty all the time. 
And Jesus brings it right down to the most common denominator. And Jesus is saying this, as followers of Jesus Christ, we should tell the truth all the time. So here's what Jesus does. The third point in your notes. Man, it's quiet in here. The third point in your notes is this, Jesus raises the bar. Jesus raises the bar and insists that you and I must always tell the truth. Notice verse 37. I'm not sure whether we put it up on the screen again. Notice verse 37. So summarizing all of this, Jesus comes down to verse 37, and here's what he says. Let what you say be simply yes or no. No ambiguity, no distorting the truth. Let what you say be yes or no. And then he says, anything more than that comes from evil. Let me give you three practical applications for us to chew on this week. The first is this. The expectation for your truthfulness The expectation for my truthfulness is based on the character of God who cannot lie. The expectation of our truthfulness is based on the character of God who cannot lie. Proverbs 6, 16 and 17 says this, there are six things that the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. Notice what it says. Next verse, verse 17. Haughty eyes, What's the second one? A lying tongue. And and he associates a lying tongue with hands that shed innocent blood. I mean, to us, man, lying is innocuous. At times, lying is just, it's just what we do. It's not that big a deal. Come on, Brian. Everybody does it. God hates it. Whether we justify it, whether we find excuse for it, whether it's convenient, whether it's expedient, the Bible says that God hates lying. Why is that? It's against his character. It's against who he is. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18, the writer of Hebrews says, so that two unchangeable things in which, notice this phrase, it is impossible for God to lie. Why is it impossible for God to lie? Because it's against his character. All right, he cannot go against his character. Titus chapter one and verse two, Paul says, the hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began. And I, I kind of sat back and meditated on that this week. I am so glad that God never lies. I'm so glad that I don't have to read verses in Scripture and say, come on now, really? (laughs) Really? I, I mean, when God looks at us and he says, Mike, I give you eternal life. We don't have to sit back and say, man, is he fudging on the truth of that? Or is that really truthful? I mean, you know, God, if God acted like us, he could look at Mike and say, man, I don't want to hurt Mike's feelings. And so I'm like, yeah, you have eternal life, Mike. Amen. All right, you, you have eternal life. I just don't want to hurt the guy's feelings. And so it's more convenient for me to tell him that than to tell him the truth. No, when God tells us we have eternal life, guess what? We have eternal life. When God tells us that he will never leave us or forsake us, guess what? He will never leave us or forsake us. When God tells us, listen, I'm gonna take care of all of your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus, we can take that to the bank. Why? Because God never lies. God is always truthful. That's why it's so important as you're reading through Scripture, man, every time you find a promise in Scripture, circle it, underline it, put an X beside it, write it down, memorize it. Why? Because God has made you a promise that he, according to his character, is guaranteed to fulfill. God is truth. And so when God looks at us and he says, let your yes be yes and your no, no, that expectation for truthfulness is based upon his character. And remember, we saw in the very beginning of the message that the character of the enemy 
is dishonesty. He is the father of lies. He is a murderer from the beginning. And so whenever we tell an untruth, whether in our mind it's justified or not, who are we looking like? We're looking like the enemy. And so the expectation for truthfulness is based on the character of God. Here's the next thing that I wrote in my notes. It's this. Speak and live in such a way that your words and actions are always authentic and never doubted. That's a powerful statement. Live and speak in such a way that your words and actions are always authentic and never doubted. This list, actually, um, if we would have lived in Jesus' time, this list would have been humorous to us. You know, swearing by heaven, swearing by earth, swearing by Jerusalem, swearing by the hairs of your head. I mean, why were they having to make such statements? Because nobody believed them. They weren't living in, in an authentic way. They were dishonest. And so as they made dishonest statements, they had to find ways to make these dishonest statements sound believable. In other words, if they had lived authentically, they wouldn't have had to back up what they were saying. People would have simply believed them at their word. In other words, their yes would be yes, and their no, no. Aesop's fables... He wrote about the boy who cried wolf too often. You familiar with that story? The tale concerns the little shepherd boy who, as he was out watching the flock, decided one day that he would trick the villagers. So as he was watching the sheep, he yelled out, Wolf! Wolf! And here come all of the villagers with their weapons ready to protect the sheep. And there's the little boy over in the corner, the boy over in the corner just giggling because he had fooled everybody. A few days later, he decides to do the same thing. Woof, woof. And once again, here comes the people of the village out to protect their sheep. And as they showed up, they once again realized that the shepherd boy had only been pulling their leg. He was not telling the truth. Well, the day came when a wolf did come. And the boy yelled out as he had previously yelled out, woof, woof. And everybody sat back and thought, ah, he's just joking. That's just that shepherd boy who's pulling our leg again. It's interesting, there's two endings to that fable. If you've ever read the fable, the the simple ending is that the wolf came and ate some of the sheep and left. But the other ending is that the wolf came and not only ate some of the sheep, but that he ate the shepherd boy as well. I'm not sure which ending is true. You can Google that and see. What's the idea? The idea is this, that you and I should speak and live in such a way that people believe what we say. Our life is authentic. What we say, what we do is truthful. As a follower of Jesus Christ, it is important that we are authentic, that we are credible, that we are honest, that people take what we say at face value. So let me give you just some practical examples of that, all right? Maybe don't hit anybody today, but just some practical examples. Be honest at home. When you're with your kids, when you're with your husband or your wife, be honest at home. If you stop by someplace on the way home and you don't want your wife to know, don't come home and lie to her about it. Be honest. Teach your kids to be honest. We are so guilty of teaching our kids dishonesty by our actions. The phone rings. Hey, Mom! It's so-and-so. Tell him I'm not home. (laughs) We're not only demonstrating dishonesty, but at that moment, what are we teaching our kids? At that moment, we're teaching our kids that it is okay to lie at certain times. Let me challenge you. Be honest at home. Husbands, always be honest with your wives. I know there's a running joke among men, you know, that at times we don't tell our wives everything. I don't find that in Scripture at all. As a matter of fact, we treat our wives just as Jesus treats the church, and he's completely honest with us. Wives, be honest with your husbands. Don't hide anything. 
Be honest with your kids. Be honest at home. Be honest at work. So very important. Put in a full day's work. Don't, don't, don't cheat your employer. Keep your word. Don't take anything from work that you do not pay for. At work, let your yes be yes and your no, no. As a matter of fact, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you should be known as the most honest person in your workplace. Your supervisor should know that when you say something, you mean it and that you will keep it. Why? Because you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you were honest all the time. Be honest at work. Be honest in your finances. Don't lie on your taxes. If you're given too much change in return, here's a novel idea. Return it. Be honest, all right? Be honest in everything. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 21. Paul says, For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. Why is that? Because we're followers of Jesus Christ. We're children of the King. We should make sure that our yes is yes and our no is no. Let me show you one more phrase. And it's so powerful, and yet Jesus ends with it. He says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. And here's what he says. Anything more than that comes from evil. Depending upon your translation, your translation might say, anything more than that comes from the evil one. So, so, so here's what you and I have all the time. At any given moment, we have the Holy Spirit of God who is indwelling us, that is encouraging us, tell the truth, be honest, be transparent, be sincere, do what you promise, fulfill your commitments. That's what God, who is truth, is saying to us. And on the other end, you know the proverbial two angels on the shoulder? And on the other end, we have the great tempter, our enemy, who is the father of lies, who is saying, what's the big deal? It's just one lie. What's the, do you realize the complications that you're going to have if you tell the truth? It's so much easier to just tell an untruth and get away with it. Who is feeding that into our mind? It's not the Holy Spirit of God. That thought, anything other than absolute truthfulness, comes from the evil one. It comes from the enemy. So, so here's my question for you today. Who do you look like? Who do you resemble? In your words, in your actions, in the promises that you make, who do you resemble? You see, as children of God, we have been called to resemble our Heavenly Father. And by the way, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, I am, what did he say? The truth. I am the life. Listen, there's no way that we can be completely truthful without the truth of the gospel resonating in our lives. Because the natural response, as seen in the four-year-old who learns to lie, the natural response that comes from the natural man within us is to what? Is to not tell the truth. What do we need? We need the help of the truthful one. We need the help of Jesus Christ so that his character is displayed through our lives. You stand before a court of law, before you give your testimony, you place your hand on the Bible, and you make this statement. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That should be my desire each and every day, and your desire. God, help me to be a man. Help me to be a woman of truthfulness. Help me to be like 
Jesus. Jesus.